many of you will say, well, I mean, how would I know if I make something more beautiful or more attractive, these are views, how do I know what it means to increase sales? <clears throat> and I say, how does marketing know that adding these features increases sales? The answer is, they lie. <laughs> Now, they're intelligent lies, and, and, and executives are not stupid. Executives know that the marketing people have made up the story. So it has to be a plausible story. But damn it, you can lie just as well as marketing. <laughs> right, right, exactly. I mean, there's certain things you have to learn in doing this. Again, it has to be reasonable. So if you want to be more effective, you have to learn the language of not necessarily all of you, but enough of you. We need more senior designers in senior executive positions. It can help make these decisions and it help propagate what you really do and give you the time and resources you need to do it right. As opposed to a big company that has a very proud of their UX team, while we have five people in our UX team of our company of 200,000 people. <laughs> no. But we have to show that it makes a difference to what they care about, which is how well a company is doing. Because look, I was at Apple in the exciting days. It was really filled with wonderful, exciting things, and we did do exciting products. But we were losing money. And it doesn't matter how great your product is if nobody buys it. And that's where marketing comes in. And so actually, instead of fighting with marketing, they should also be our friends. Because in theory, we're after the same thing. They think they own the customer, and we think we own the customer, and we both do. But what we want to do is make things that really fill, fulfill the needs of people, that they can understand and love and appreciate. And what marketing wants is things that people buy. So they have to be happy if they want it, but they need our stuff. We really fulfill what they need, but it doesn't do any good if they don't buy it. And so we like to do observations, field studies, and they like to do surveys and questionnaires because they're, ask, they're asking a different question. So if we were actually together as a team, that would really help because they could do the spreadsheets. <laughs> so that's sort of this weird path I've traveled over the years, over the last 25 years. From here are the principles that make something understandable to uh, how do we take these general principles and make them work for all time, or at least for, say, 50 years, to, oh, business requires other things. So in business, you actually have to be practical. You have to get things done on schedule. You have to worry about the competing requirements of the competitive marketplace. And you have to help the company stay alive, make money. And so that's what I all, I try to put all of that into this book, which is why it's 100 pages longer. I added the two new chapters at the end, design thinking and design in the world of business. And I modified the examples along the way to be more relevant to today, to try to be last for the next 25 years, and the importance of emotion. Design of everyday things. Thank you. Captive before we start with the Q&A. I just want to remind you that after the, um, after the Q&A session closes, we're going to have a raffle for some books and for ticket to convey UX in Seattle in February. And we're also celebrating a special, uh, a special event today. We're celebrating the fact that the group has surpassed 30,000 members. And we have... And I'd like to say that it's and one cake per thousand, but we have um, 
one cake for to celebrate Dorman's, uh, Don Norman's new book. So it has all the hashtags, uh, just help yourselves afterward. And after we're all done, we would like to ask uh, all the volunteers while people file next door to Bodega to grab a drink, to just stay and help us put Cross Campus back as we found it when we got here. And now we can start with questions. Who wants to start? Question? Okay. So the video streaming didn't work. Interesting. Technology is fun when it works. So, there we go. question for you. When a, when a company, when a CEO is trying to make a decision to hire... So when a company is trying to make a decision to either hire developers that typically do the programming, or hire designers that do interface and user experience, how do you kind of communicate to a, a CEO kind of which direction to take when they're trying to make those hiring decisions? The question is when the CEO, when the executive management, it's not the CEO, when the executive management is trying to figure out the resource application so that they want to, every, every team needs more people. That's a rule. And no more space, too, by the way. And, and better parking. <laughs> so where do you allocate the resources? There be enough programming team, or the design team, or the service team, or the manufacturing team, or the sales team. That's the wrong question to ask, and it's too late to ask. It. So that if you're concerned about the UX team and they're too small to do its job, that means that the job isn't understood and appreciated by management. So you don't start by making a strong argument that we need more people, because it won't. Everybody is making that argument. What you have to do is you have to work your way up to show that they're losing money, that you can cause them to get more money, more sales, more satisfied customers, less service calls, less repairs. And you have to do that. Well, here we go again. You need to tell your team should hire some MBAs. You don't need an MBA, but an MBA gives you a lot of the kind of training that's required to make the argument. Actually, most design consultancies have started to hire MBAs. And many design schools are now offering joint MBA and, and uh, Master of Design degrees. And a number of MBA schools, I actually was one of the first to do this at Northwestern, offers a joint program in design and MBA. But you need people who can make the business case. And eventually, as the executives start to believe that their products are suffering because they're not, a, the UX team isn't appropriate. That's when they will increase the size. Because you have to look at the total system. And one of the problems, one of the ways, look, when I was a vice president of Apple, how did I decide who was the most valuable people in my team? Well, they were valued in many ways. Some people were the world's best expert on, you know, video uh, communication. In other words, the best expert on video. In other words, the best expert on actually the regulatory system, which was important. I spent a lot of time in Washington, I'm actually one of the people who helped get the high definition TV standards that we have today. If anybody who knows them, they're a mess. Now, 24 different standards. But I spent a lot of time in Washington with computer companies battling the television companies so we had better standards. Um, and I also helped bring about the Wi Fi ban. I don't take credit for it, but my team did it. But I was the, the spokesperson who spent a lot of time in Washington helping convince the FCC to allocate this band of network of bandwidth at no cost. And believe me, there were lots of fights. For example, the person next to me was representing the fire chiefs of America, who were essential, argued essentially for human safety. We must have that bandwidth for ourselves. So it's hard to make one argument against the other one. But we need to get into the management head, or what it is we do. Questions? I, I don't need it. Um, yeah, you yeah. do, because the other people oh, can't hear. Um, this is probably maybe very generic, but uh, 
when you're talking about building your teams and, and, your, and your example from marketing saying that we have these three new features that must be and that really rings true, um, how, how do you view sort of the UX practitioner or the UX team uh, in relation to the organization? So for example, um, some UX teams are under marketing, some UX teams are under development, some UX teams stand by themselves. Um, but I mean, my personal experience is that the marketing team tends to trump anything that the UX team does. Uh, but I'm just curious, uh, uh, like that, that role and that relationship between the three, I know they have to work together, but maybe from a hierarchical standpoint. Thank you, because you reminded me that I didn't finish my story. The story. Anybody else? Yes, you do. What's the little When I try to see who's of value in the company, I look at people not for their expertise in the narrow fields. Those are very important people. We want to keep them. But I, the future leaders are the person who tries to step back and ask the company perspective not the UI perspective, or not the technology perspective, or not the marketing perspective, but the company perspective. What's better for the company? And your question is, um, well, where do you put the UX team, first of all? And I think it's a mistake to put them under anybody. They ought to, the UX team ought to be just as independent as the marketing teams, as the engineering team. And then the product team will have representatives from all of them. And during the cycle, you'll have different numbers of people. So in the beginning, there'll be mostly designers, but you need to have some, right. someone from marketing, someone from either manufacturing or distribution or something, depending upon the kind of product. And then as you're going into the actual building of it, again, it's mostly going to be the engineering and programming people. You've got to have it. some design representative from some marketing representative. Because the standard story is that <coughs> Engineers hate designers. They think they do things that are impossible for us to do. <laughs> and designers hate engineers because they think they ruin what they design. And both of them agree on one topic. They both hate marketing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's wrong because marketing people are smart, and engineers are smart, and designers are smart. But we look at the world through different eyes, through different perspectives. Often all of them are correct. And so if you can get them all working as a team, if we really understood what each of the requirements were, we could actually, from the beginning, try to accommodate all the requirements. And instead of having them ruin it because it didn't meet their requirements, if we knew it in the beginning, we could, we could make us all work. But let me tell you about the story of the Sony radio, which I had in my hotel room uh, in Boston last week. The Sony home press, home press Sony radio had a button on the side, on the left corner, that basically was labeled better sound. <laughs> now why would they do that? The UX team says, we've got to remove the button and save some money and make it easier to understand and, and etc., right? Marketing one is better. And maybe they should have. But how else would you know it had better sound? Because it's labeled better sound, and I can push it, and oh, it's better. <laughs> and unpush it, oh, it's worse. <laughs> and so I only use it once. And from then on, I always keep it pushed down, right? <laughs> but that was very important in making the sale. You know about, you all know about the QWERTY typewriter, right? Well, you probably all know the wrong story. First of all, you think it was designed to slow up typing, which is false. It also turns out to be a pretty fast typewriter. It was designed to, to minimize damming. The so letters that type near each other were far apart on the type near each other time were far apart on the, on the screen. So it ends up you alternate hands, which is the fastest way of typing. But it's QWERTY, ER. Wait a minute, ER is a common pair. Why are they right next to each other? Well, if you look at the first machine that made by Remington and the patent application, it's not ER, it's QWE period. And the R was down to the bottom right. And so that's true, that I could document. And the story that is told in 
hard to document is that the early sales people, we didn't have marketing in those days, sales people looked at the typewriter keyboard and said, oh, if we interchange the R and the period, we could type the word typewriter on the top row of the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can demonstrate it. One finger, we type it there. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Now, you have to remember that this was not the first typewriter ever built. There were 30 or 40 typewriter companies, and they all failed. This was the first typewriter that was ever successful. Was it because of that change? <coughs> Who knows? But marketing plays an important role. So violating the design rule with the keys, maybe, was important. And putting in an extra button that says, better sound, is important. So it isn't that we should fight with marketing about, ooh, you make it harder for people. We should, again, think of what's best for the company. And selling more radios or more typewriters is what's best for them. Now I'm terrified. Uh, you have a question there? Hi, Don. My name is Tia. I'm a copywriter, and I'm a direct response marketing consultant. And my question for you is, why is it you think that um, professionals in the UX industry don't really speak about copywriting, but at the same time tonight, you've shown us um, how words play such an important part. You just gave us an example with the letters on the keyboard, and the name of the book, and um, the better sound, you know, on the radio. So I was just wondering, why, why, is, why is it you think that copywriting isn't mentioned in the U.S. industry? Well, it isn't copywriting that isn't mentioned. It's copywriting and marketing and sales and manufacturing and distribution and supply chain management and competitive pressures and the patent system. Basically, every little discipline thinks about its little discipline. And moreover, every little discipline thinks it's the most important in the world, because otherwise, why would you be doing it? <laughs> and so most disciplines don't look very far outside their own discipline. So it isn't that we don't talk about roles like copywriting. That's a funny term. Uh, how about all the communication that goes which is also the people, the technical writers who write the manuals and the advertisements and so on. Uh, because it's often we think of our specialty. And what I really want people to do is start thinking of it as a system. The whole system has to work. I invented the term user experience with that in mind. That's gotten lost. Remember I said that what happened, we divided each of the, we had lots of thousands of little components about usability. And they never won compared to losing the data. Well, if you had put them together in a system, that might have been more important than occasional crashes. Look at the Apple iPod. Why was it successful? It's not that great. <coughs> no, I mean, it is great, OK? But the point is, iRiver, Korean company, had a music player that was just as good, actually had more capacity, I think and was not, was not unattractive. What Apple did was they made it a system. To use the iRiver, you had to be a technologist. You had to be a geek. You had to understand how to find the music, and it would be legal to get it. And then you had to be able to get it to your machine. And then you had to be able to transform the format into a format that iRiver used. And then you had to figure out how to get it to the iRiver system. And Apple said, well, first of all, the, the biggest breakthrough that Apple made was making it legal to get the music, breaking the licensing, and then deciding to sell it at a reasonable price, 99 cents a song, and then finding an SAP database of music, and everyone knows SAP is impossible to use, and Apple put a front end on it and called it iTunes, and then making it really easy to buy something. It was easy to find the music, and then you say, I want that, and boop, it was in your machine. And then you plug in the iPod, and it was in the iPod. You didn't have to do anything or know anything. 
And then the people wanted to make accessories, and so Apple allowed them to make accessories. And I always wondered, why did Apple not take them themselves and make money on the speakers and the timers and all that other stuff? That's why I realized, a friend of mine pointed out to me, that that was risky. They might not they, First of all, it cost money to develop, and not all of them would sell. So this way, they let all the other companies develop and take the risks. And if they want to use this magic little symbol with a rectangle with a circle and a little small rectangle, 10% of sales. So Apple gets 100% margin with zero risk. So they thought of it as a system. And that's why it won. And so we have to start thinking of our stuff as a system. The user experience is from you first learn about the product, is how you do the advertisement, and what it looks like in the stores. And in the early days, some of those early Apple computers, you'd buy it, and it wouldn't fit in your car. And we discovered there was no reason for that. It was just because it was in the wrong box. So we could package it, same computer, so it would fit in the car. And then people didn't know how to open it. So we, we put on top, when you open the box, the first thing you saw was a piece of paper that said, read me. And, it was, and it made it, we made it so it was easy to assemble. And we did that by watching all the issues. Mind you, I haven't yet even talked about how the computer worked or how you used it. But you had to think about this as a system, and the same with the manuals. The manuals today are written at the, at the end. You get these great manual writers, and you give them a week after it's all finished. And I've always thought the correct way to design a system is first write the advertisements. So you know what the exciting thing is going to do. Then you write the manuals. You write the simplest possible, easy to understand manual. And you give these to the design and engineering team, and those are the specs. So for the first time, a manual might be understandable. And the system would be understandable. And the copy would be an essential component of the design. But we need system thinking. <laughs> I didn't hear that question. Actually, I have a hotel by the airport, so it doesn't, because I knew I would probably be late. So. Yeah, my name is Jeff. Uh, if you could list your top three tips for marketing your idea to your organization, and if so, possibly you can give us five or seven tips. Are you succeeding doing it? I missed top three tips for marketing your idea to the organization. And if possible, you well, it depends on the organization a lot, but I've already pointed out one of the important wow. things that organizations care about is it increases right, sales. And more importantly, the profits of the organization. Which you can do by either reducing costs or increasing sales. And that's really important in marketing. You have to convince them. But there's a little bit more to it. Um, here's a story I got from BMW. I got I, I work with BMW, so that's I'm biased. But, and I bought a new BMW, and I just love the heads-up display. My wife and I both feel we'd never buy a car without it. So when we drive the car, they're sitting about six feet in the front of the car. We can see the speed limit and how fast we're going, and the navigational instructions. And it's actually easy to read. We've got two players to give you. Just what you need, not too much. Um, actually, driving to the airport today, I pulled in too close to the car in front of me. And suddenly, on the heads up display, there's a big red vehicle saying, I'm too close. We love it, okay? Really wonderful driving. BMW didn't, some engineer developed it, and BMW management said, It's stupid, we don't want it. So, how did they convince me? They could have done the sales move numbers, but they tried a different route. They tried the emotional route. But they had a couple of test cars with it, with it. They convinced one of the executives to take home the test car. And the executive couldn't be bothered. He let his wife drive it. And his wife said, wow, I don't want to give this car back. <laughs> and that's what convinced BMW. I often tell this story about how executives make decisions. You go to the executive room and there's a big, big wooden table. The executives all sit around the table. And then 
around the outside, there are chairs like the ones you have. They have fancy chairs, but around the outside, there are chairs like this, and that's where the staff sits. Any of you have seen executive decision rooms like that? Um, many of you may have sat in those little, little small chairs around the outside. So anyway, when they want to make a decision, the team comes in and gives a presentation, and they give all these spreadsheets and numbers and wonderful stories, and then when they're finished, they either go sit in the chairs around the outside, or they leave the room. And then the executives sit, and they look at each other, and they say, well, um, and then one of them says, you know, the other day my daughter came home from school to tell the story. And then they say, yeah, yeah, we should do this. And they vote for that. Now, what is the role of the story? It isn't that the story is how they made up their minds. Okay? Just the story alone would not have done it. But the problem with numbers is that we know people have made them up. Okay? And um, they're very abstract. And when someone tells a story that's relevant, you, you say, yeah, that feels right. And yeah, that's consistent with the numbers. Or, yeah, that feels right. And boy, that's not what they were trying to do. So we better not do it. The story is very important. And actually, um, I work with IDO folks a lot, and IDO is proud of their storytelling. And so one of the things they always do, in addition to the numbers, what they need to do, is they make sure there are always stories about how this will be used, about how Mary comes home and does this, that, and the other. Because the story hits the emotional side, and second, it's a, it's a specific instance. Because otherwise, we're talking in the abstract about the wonders of this great new cooking machine that will make better food and so on, as opposed to John was working late at night, the project kept going and going and going, and he finally gets home at 9 p.m. John really likes to eat good food, but um, he never has any time. He gets home at 9 p.m., and he, has to, he doesn't want to sit and cook and make great food, so what's he going to do? Wow, we have this new machine. You put the food in, and you tell it how you'd like it done, and you can walk away and do anything else you want, and then it will cook it perfectly. And if the, when it's ready to be done, if a phone call comes and you're busy, and you come back 10 minutes too late, it's not overcooked, it's perfect. So it gives you high quality and wonderful convenience. In fact, you can take frozen, frozen chicken breast and put it on and put it into the machine, and it comes out perfect. You did not have to defrost it. So, you tell the story about John and how much time it gave her. Tell her how she can now finally work with her children or something because she came home late after a big business meeting, etc. Um, and that's what makes a sale, we hope, because that's actually a description of a startup that I've started. And uh, we're in, oh, please fund us so we can make the first kind of prototypes. We just need $3 million. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> but we, the story is wonderful. The story makes a difference. We give slides and stuff. But first of all, we tell the story. And second of all, while we're telling the story, we're cooking the rice so that you can't stick around. It is. It makes perfect steak. Do you like rare steak? It's rare. <laughs> and, and no water and no plastic bags for those of you who think you know how it works. Anyway, numbers and story. Notice how cleverly I um, delegated the decision making authority. <laughs> um, you spoke a lot about your academic uh, experiences, and I was wondering um, what you found, uh, what kind of programs you found to be the most beneficial to people working in this field, and how to help, how to um, address the issues of specialization in academic settings, where this is such an interdisciplinary field. Well, well, how you should get more of a, how you should get the education really varied a lot because 
presume each of you has your own particular interests and background. And so it's a different school of thought in different cities. And also, um, if you want to go back and get a master's degree in the field, it's really expensive to go to a normal school. And not only is it an expensive tuition and living, but you have to give up your jobs to you. So not everybody can afford that. Um, there are good schools that really do this well. One of the best schools, I believe, is the Technical University of Delft. That all of you want to move to, uh, to Delft in the Netherlands. Um, and Delft is in China. Delft, China. Um, and I, I'm, a, I'm a trustee of the Institute of Design in Chicago, part of IRT, which is a two year or three year program, depending on what you do, which is really excellent. They're not good at giving you design skills. They actually um, are much more emphasizing planning and strategy. Along those lines, what about your course that you're developing? Get there. <laughs> and, um, and there are a bunch of schools. I mean, there is a whole bunch here, right? In the LA region. But the California College of the Arts in San Francisco, I think, is a good school. It's in less expensive, the uh, Pasadena Art School. Center. Center, right, is a well-known good school, although it tends to be more traditional. And so you really want a school that emphasizes the uh, human-centered side, and doing ethnography, and field studies, and some of the business things. But all the better design schools are moving now. Um, you can also teach yourself. You just get a lot of experience in doing self-teach yourself. Read books, uh, talk to other designers, try to get a job relevant and work with, if you're not in the right job or in the right company, you can often move sideways by working with people and going to people and so on. And yeah, there are books and there are courses. There are, so there is now the MOOC, massive online open courses that are free. Now, I don't know how you teach a design course in MOOC. We have many, many thousands of students, but there are a number of us trying. So there's a course that comes out of the University of Pennsylvania in one Coursera. I, um, no, no, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he's actually, he, re he wrote a standard design book on, uh, oh, Carl, engineering design book. Carl Ulrich? Oh, no, product design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carl Ulrich? Carl Ulrich. Ulrich, thank you. Yes. And uh, Scott Clemmer, who used to be at Stanford and is now at University of California, San Diego, has done a Coursera. And I'm doing a Udacity course with um, Christian Simsarian. Christian uh, was at IDO and now is head of interaction design at CCA, California College of the Arts in San Francisco. And um, that course, we actually will go into user testing next week. And then we'll be released, obviously, the next week. I put nothing <laughs> on the wall with user testing. But, um, so, but the course that I'm doing with Christian will not turn you into a great designer. Uh, it will, it's a bit like this book. The, the main function of this book is to get people excited by desire to get them moving into the field or deciding they wanted to go into the field, changing the field. <coughs> not a number of you probably have that story. That's what people tell me a lot. But it's not enough to be a designer. And it doesn't give you the practical skills. So the course gives you even less material than is in the book. The course follows the book, but it is abbreviated. It gives you what we think is the important fundamentals to get you going. We give you some design exercises. So um, the first, some of them are observational, and one of them, the next big one is make a box. I really love this one. Make a box. And then we want you to do whatever you want to it. Add stuff to it, or cut away things in the box, or do something so that you can take that box and put it on a table and walk away. And then other people will come by and see it and be attracted to it, and they will pick it up, turn it over, and rub it. <laughs> how you do, you're not allowed to have any instructions. So how do you do that? So Because this is a lot of what the traditional designers are so fantastically good at, doing sorts of things like that. And the people in the traditional HCI community will say, huh? <laughs> and so it's a really good bridge. So we do it, and then we have another final project, which is to, to build a time bank. You don't have to know what it is, but it's to build potentially an app. 
uh, the, the screens for now. You don't have to do them. Uh, so the point is it gets you going, but not really exposed. But it's supposed to be a two-week course. It just chapters one or two in the book. Because these long courses are too long. No one can finish them. And the dropout rate is horrible. But it's weird. So 100,000 people took Sebastian Thrun's AI course, and the dropout rate was 90%. <laughs> you think that's horrible? Hey, 10,000 people finished the course. You ever hear of an AI course, a tough Stanford-level AI course that 10,000 people finish? And the people, the 90% that dropped out, was, was it all a failure? No, some of them may have gone family affairs, other things happen. Or they may have said, I've learned what I need to know, and I'm going to stop. So it's really hard to know. And by the way, of the 10,000 that finished, Sebastian was teaching the same course at Stanford while he was doing the MOOC. And so he gave the same final exam to the MOOC students and to the Stanford students, and the best grade came to the MOOC students. Uh, mainly because, look, when you have 100,000 people signed up, the list of all, you know, large numbers means there'll be some really, really bright people. Um, but so the design course, we don't quite know how it's going to work. Design is, requires someone watching over you, giving you advice and critiques. So it's going to be a real experiment. But, um, but the three different design courses are ways of getting yourself going. But they're not enough to be a good designer. That's the way it's done. By the way, the MOOCs are trying to experiment, and so um, what Udacity is about to do is to offer the course both free and also for money. And the difference will be you can take the free course, which are just the way the courses are now, and if you pay money, you get um, a tutor, basically. You, you can ask questions, and there's somebody, and be, hopefully it's always the same person who responds to you, who can look over and help you and give you advice, and the people will be trained in the field. Again, it's an experiment. We don't know how that will work. But it's a revolution in education, comedy. But it's kind of like the new kinds of input devices that are happening all over the place with all the sensors. We don't know how it's going to work. What is it called? MOOC? Massive Online Open Course. I didn't invent it. That's what they call it. <laughs> Now it's interesting, Coursera is trying to replace yeah, universities, kind of. And edX, which is kind of like the university version of it. Udacity isn't trying to do that. Udacity is for people like you who want to move up in your jobs. You want to learn Python programming, take the Python course. You want to learn uh, about <coughs> genetics, take the genetics course. You want to learn advanced programming, take the advanced programming class. So it's for, it's for people who are working and want either to move to a new discipline or want to advance their skills <laughs> So it's after a different market. But again, we should go and experiment and see how it works. And it's free. So you can if you can't see my course yet because it's it's just being released to the testing room. But, um, and how long it will take to release the expensive results on the unit test. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much again. And now um, UX Radio and Conte UX are going to draw their uh, raffle prizes. And Don is going to be available for some book signing. All right, we have a raffle. <laughs> okay, so um, UX Radio is giving away three of the new books the design of everyday things. So for those of you who don't have your book, or maybe if you do have a book, you can give it to a lucky friend. So um, Don would be glad to sign your copy. Um, he's going to be signing over here in just a moment. The first number on the ticket is...
So you might want to check out the website for that. And also we're offering free registration to people that want to show off their work at the conference. So those are free opportunities. And uh, hopefully it, it's, a, it's a real popping community in, in Seattle for UX right now. The job market's really hot. So uh, if you uh, hear your number, just call it out and meet me at the uh, left side of the stage and I'll get your information. Uh, so the first one, number I have, if that person still here is 421. Oh, yeah. We have a winner right here. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you very much, and I hope to see you in Seattle. Thank you. And it's not over. Wait, yeah, here's another one. I don't know, because I did box and box. I've never won anything ever. Okay, so we're here for vitamin T and we're giving away 10 free user tests at usertesting.com. So uh, if you signed up, we got your name in here and this is going to pick. And we'll tell you your name. Tony Von... Right. Tony Von G. You just won. Come up to the front. Yeah, that, that helped. That's all right, Sean. Come here, Luke. Yeah. You're gonna go next door? Okay, so we have uh, two more to give That's away. Good. Yeah, it, it, the only problem is after the time. Cat Kitte? Cat Kitte? Come on down. <laughs> the way it works with them, you have to like. And uh, the third winner for the user testing.com 10 user test, Ulysses Pascal. Ulysses Pascal. Congratulations. Cat? Oh, she's coming. 
So we got a set of books from a book apart for people who make websites. As Ashley Sonselli, A S L I S O N C L C E L O I. Okay, um, again, I'll repeat that. Ashley Sonselli. Okay. And again, this is for the books. Howard Saft. Howard Saft. He wants books. Howard? If you're Howard, be one. <laughs> Don't forget to stop by our table before you leave. Thank you. your trash that you left by your seats and the volunteers if we can start helping taking the trash cans out and folding the chairs. Thank you.
The director of track. <laughs> Thanks for your help, man. Oh, no problem, man. Yeah. It's a bummer, but I mean, that's the point. Oh, really? Yeah, it's actually something that's in here. set up, whatever happened, it got jammed like that, I had to right. get a new event, and then it worked oh, okay. Right, right, right. But it's, you know, I, I don't really understand why that would happen, but it does. Yeah. yeah. So, so it went well, people, people enjoyed themselves. So. Yeah, and he recorded, uh, Cole recorded it, and then we posted on Vimeo later. Awesome. Okay. So that was really only for about 30 people who couldn't be here. Right, right. Um, right. Really I was going to say, <laughs> Thank you. 